This is Hidden Killers Week in Review. A look back at the most prolific stories of the week. You're listening to the Hidden Killers Podcast with Tony Bruski. Featuring attorney, guest, and former felony prosecutor Eric Fadis. Going back over to uh, to Chad Daybell, uh, prosecutors saying that uh, they're relying on uh, some emails from Lori Vallow's uh, late brother Alex Cox. Uh, some information that is uh, coming in that's part of uh, her trial of course, Alex Cox uh, alleged to have shot and killed Lori's ex-husband, Char- not alleged, but did uh, kill uh, Lori's ex-husband, Charles Vallow. Uh, what could possibly be in these emails that would be beneficial to Chad uh, Daybell? You know, is it something that that places the blame solely on the co-defendant, Lori Vallow Daybell? Uh, perhaps that's what's in there. I haven't seen them, so I can't say for sure. Um, but just kind of thinking out loud and based on my experience in cases, um, I'm wondering if, if it's something that, that really sort of places the onus on Lori, shows that she is the ringleader, that she was behind all of this, and Chad was perhaps more of a peripheral figure from the defense perspective. Um, it, it could be something like that, but we'll have to wait and see. Yeah. Uh, do you think John Pryor is prepared to go to trial? I mean, I know they just had the hearing. He said he's he's good. Uh, but, you know, that was after much pushback and a lot of saying, I, I, I don't have a second chair yet. I, there's no way I'm going to be able to be ready in time, but we're going at, at the set date. Is this a change of uh, heart or just kind of a, well, you know, I had to, you know, really ramp this up and, and really get my myself focused to to be ready for this uh, this upcoming trial of Chad Davo. You know, he certainly doesn't look ready. Every time that I, I see him in court, I just sort of exudes the, this, this uh, sense of like deer in headlights, like I need some help. Mm-hmm. Um, and so if, if if you're a murder client like Chad Daybell, that's got to be extraordinarily concerning. Um, I, I worry that uh, the preparation, uh, it, it, it's going to require so much preparation for this case. He keeps saying he's not there. Is that sort of a, a posturing for a, for a potential appeal? Maybe. Um, but, you know, we've also got to hope that Chad Daybell uh, gets a gets a fair trial here, and and that that appears to be an ongoing question too. Yeah, I mean, is that something where you know would he willingly want to kind of throw himself under the bus for an appeal, an appellate issue? I mean, that obviously doesn't look good on him uh, if if that's how it it is, or does it, or does it really not affect him? Because he did raise his hand and say, "Look, I'm not qualified for a death penalty case," and they still said, "Well, good luck." <laughs> You're still going forward with this. You know, it, it, it's just it's an interesting dynamic because obviously he's looking out and trying to defend his client. But at the same point, you know, he has his own image to worry about as well. You know, there's something to be said for falling on the sword and and sort of, you know, taking the blame, whether or not it's wholly your fault. Mm-hmm. And, and attorneys do that. And and sometimes it's honorable. Sometimes it's it's bluffing. It's, 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 uh, so it's a little hard to read. Um, but but I think that the attorney sort of got on this case because he, at least in my opinion, thought it might boost his profile as an attorney. And now he's had to sort of come publicly and say multiple times, I don't have the confidence to do this. I'm not proficient in death penalty cases. I'm not ready for trial. And so any any sort of PR benefit he may have received by taking this case, I think is been wasted. How often does that happen where people jump onto cases because of the high profile nature of it and think, well, this will be, you know, this will, this will definitely get me in the spotlight and then realize oh, maybe I shouldn't have done that. Well, that is central to um, the hearing for Fannie Willis in Georgia on, on, on the Trump case Yeah, uh, it, it is whether um, she enlisted this other prosecutor, I think Nathan Wade or something like yeah. that. Um, and, and he didn't really have any significant experience in any sort of criminal prosecution like that. Um, and so does it happen? Absolutely. And, and the allegation is that Nathan Wade was doing it kind of just to become more popular and boost his influence and whatever else. Um, and attorneys, man, like some of us have egos and 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 uh, uh, it would not surprise me that an attorney would jump on kind of a daunting case for a potential benefit and then realize how underwater they might be on it once they get into it. Where things are sitting right now with Chad Daybell, how much of a case does he have uh, if as an appellate issue later down the road? Should he probably inevitably be found guilty? You know, is there a lot there? I mean, obviously, we look at other cases like uh, like Delphi, Richard Allen and such, and there's just a cornucopia of, inform- of, of, of issues there where it's pretty much guaranteed he got the get a new trial free card. How close is Chad Daybell to that with his current representation and the way things have been going? You know, um, it's sort of set up for a potential what's called ineffective assistance of counsel claim Mm -hmm. later on. Um, But but that's only like a half win 
on appeal, I think, for Chad Dable because um, the attorney has said, hey, I, I don't do death penalty cases. I don't know how to do the death penalty. And so if Chad Dable is convicted and sentenced to death, he might have an out on the death penalty piece of it. Mm -hmm. But he, but, but that sort of ineffective assistance would not grant him a new trial on the underlying guilt phase for the homicide. Because there's no indication that this attorney is completely inept in terms of just doing a normal homicide case. Yeah. It's the death penalty part that, that, they're, that the attorney's worried about. I wonder if that is part of the strategy here. I mean, obviously, if, if it, they know it's not winnable, the goal is simply to save his life. Is it on the back end? They didn't get it to, you know, thrown out on the front end. Is it like, look, we're going to drag our feet. We're going to show every reason why uh, I'm not qualified for this. So at the end, you can just live the rest of your life in prison. Uh, right. Is, is it some attempt by the attorney to say, hey, look, I can't do a whole lot for you on the guilt phase. The evidence is overwhelming. Yeah. But let me try to save your life, like you said, and and fall on my own sword to do that. And um, I can't help but wonder if that's what's going on. You know, would that be sort of a, a romantically noble uh, endeavor, at least for my d defense attorney yeah. mind, perhaps? Um, but, uh, but yeah, that might be the approach they're taking because they don't have much else. And I bet Chad said, you know what you do that you get to be one of the 144,000 that I save in Rexburg. <laughs> <laughs> Hallelujah. Sick of the ads. We are too. start listening with no commercials now and get access to all of our episodes in advance of everyone else. Become a true crime today. Premium plus subscriber on Apple podcasts, search true crime today. Premium plus on Apple podcasts or go to our podcast page and sign up now. True crime today. Premium plus sign up now.